I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the season that we are in. Um, it's a season that I've been looking at for really a few years now. It's the election season. But in two days, we know that America, which is sharply divided, will be shaken to its core. We get that. We don't know what's going to happen. I don't pretend to know what's going to happen with the election. I, I do believe that there will be much. I, I believe we won't know who the winner is for weeks. I will say that. Um, and to me, that's kind of a bummer because I, I really enjoyed those Tuesday nights, amen, <laughs> watching the election results. But anyways, we won't know who the winner is for weeks. But one thing's for sure, America is really divided. And we haven't seen division like this, maybe never. Now, of course, I know some of you think I was around during the Civil War, but I wasn't. <laughs> I'm not that old. But I've never seen division like this in America since I've been alive for the past almost 63 years. And we understand that God is allowing this division. In Matthew 10, 34, Jesus said something really interesting, something that many people do not know. He said this, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, that's a pretty interesting comment coming from the Prince of Peace that he came to bring a sword. And as we get closer to the return of Jesus Christ, we know that there will be a great falling away. Many people will depart from the faith. We know that in Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. So the question isn't whether Jesus brought the sword. It's why did the Prince of Peace bring the sword? Why is there so much conflict in our world? And maybe it's ramping up to a new place within the next few weeks. Why does God allow division to happen? Because God wants to separate. He said this in Matthew 25, verse 32. All nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a sheep, a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will, he will place the sheep on his right hand, which is my left hand, and he will place the goat on his left hand, which is my right hand. God makes a clear, God wants to make a clear distinction between his people and those who are not his people. In Exodus 8, 23, as Israel was about to leave Egypt, he said, I will make a clear distinction between my people and your people. The miraculous sign will happen tomorrow. So God is doing some separating. He is separating the sheep from the goats. He is separating the wheat from the tares. But God 
and God alone needs to be doing this separation. Why? Because he knows the difference. In Matthew 13, verse 28, should we pull out the weeds or the tares, the disciples asked Jesus. And, and he said, no, you'll uproot the wheat also. Let both the wheat and the tares grow up together until the harvest. Then I will tell you what to harvest, what to sort out. God has to divide between the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares. Why? Because he knows. We don't know who's for God. We don't know who's against God. We don't always understand his purpose. But the biggest problem that we have in the Church of America is sheep goats. And what do I mean by sheep goats? Well, I mean that sheep, that goats that really act like sheep. They pretend to be sheep to confuse, to, um, uh, to lie to others and pretend like they're something other than they are when they really are wolves in sheep's clothing. This is why God will do the division. The reason God is separating things now is because God wants a united people, a, a people that are of one mind, of one purpose, a people of peace, at peace with each other. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, the Apostle Paul said this, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude as Christ Jesus had. If I read this as a commercial on TV, it wouldn't get many hits. It goes against the edicts of our culture. We don't believe in this. We, we believe in taking care of ourselves, watching out for ourselves. Uh, we aren't our brother's neighbor. We, we don't have to love everybody around us. These are the exact opposite traits that Jesus Christ, than Jesus Christ had. But might I encourage you today that as we go through potentially real trying times, troubling times, might I encourage you that we have a weapon. We have a weapon that is different than the world. We have a weapon that is able to do a lot of cool things. And what is that weapon? It's called the weapon of peace. The weapon of peace. So what does this weapon of peace look like? Well, as we look in Philippians chapter 2, we see that. We see that it looks like uh, not being selfish. It looks like being humble, caring for one another, loving one another. And then... We are given a peace that surpasses all understanding. 
and we can be full of joy as we walk in this peace. And might I say that this peace that surpasses all understanding that we, we'll, we, would, we see later on in Philippians chapter 4, this is the believer's portion. We must capture this peace. Why? So that we can spread this peace. But just like Jesus, we ought to be leaving peace wherever we go. In John 14, 27, I am leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And this peace is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. God wants to give you peace. So no matter what happens in the next few weeks, it doesn't matter because you are called to be a people at peace. And the thing with peace is it is contagious. Just like COVID was contagious, Guess what else is contagious? Peace. And this is a virus that you want to catch. You want to have peace. Because everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But you are called to be unshakable because you have this peace. So thus, we are called to become people of peace and be peacemakers. One of the Beatitudes that we see in Matthew chapter 5 is, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And the world is crying out for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. And we see that in Romans 8, 19. For there, there is an earnest expectation of creation eagerly awaiting the revealing or the releasing of the sons and daughters of God. God wants to release his sons and daughters, but they will be peacemakers. So no matter what happens, no matter what goes on, you are called to be a peacemaker. God wants to use you as a peacemaker. We cannot use the same weapons as the world. We cannot pick up our bullets and shoot people. We cannot go punch people in faces and ride and burn down things if things don't go our way. No, we have to use the weapon of peace. We have to use that weapon. But pastor, look what they're doing. Look, you are a citizen of heaven before you're even a citizen of the United States of America. Now, I like being a citizen of the United States of America. But you know what? God put me here. Okay? It wasn't, I didn't decide to be born in America. I didn't say, wake up in my mother's belly and say, hey, move to America. I just happen to be born in America. I'm an American. And I love this country. I love what it stands for. I love the godly heritage that this country has. But with all that said, I need to relate with the people of 
the Christians of China, the, the largest church in, in the world. I need to relate with the believers in Iran, even though I don't like what their country is doing. Because I am a believer. And if I'm a believer, I'm called to be a peacemaker. Now this flies in the face of some people. I get that. And we are definitely in a season where not everybody's going to be happy with everything we say. Amen? I get that. I understand that. But we have to use different weapons than the world. And what do our weapons include? Well, they include love. Love covers a multitude of sin. They, they include the ministry of turning the other cheek. Nobody likes that ministry. <laughs> Nobody says, hey, let me go in the ministry of turning the other cheek. But that's a ministry as well, amen? It requires us to overcome evil with what? Of more evil? No. We overcome evil with good, amen? Hallelujah. Now, understand this. This doesn't mean that you are supposed to support any anti-biblical things that people are trying to introduce, okay? That doesn't mean that. We are not, I'm going to use a big word, capitul capitulated, capitulating. <laughs> it's funny, the Lord put that word in my mind. <laughs> we don't capitulate, capitulate with evil, we don't agree with evil. We don't approve of evil. We don't say, evil, you're good. We don't even compromise with evil, amen? We do not do that. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm not into redefining terms. Abortion is abortion, okay? You can't. Now, God forgives women if they did abort their babies. I totally agree with that. But understand this. We are not trying to redefine the term of abortion or the rainbow or, the mar or marriage. Hallelujah. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love people. It means that God doesn't want us to change biblical terms and biblical meanings. Let me just talk a little bit about abortion, okay? Abortion doesn't mean, uh, when we say pro-life, we're not talking pro-life from the womb to the tomb. When we talk about pro-life, we're talking about aborting unborn babies, amen? And there's no way we can agree with that because it is murder. Hallelujah. And, and so, and we don't agree with evil, but our weapons must be used to change culture, amen? We are called to be the change agent in culture, not the following of culture as it goes, amen? So we need to be the change agent. We need to be out there. But we have to use the weapons that are mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. And they, this includes the weapon of peace. Hallelujah. So as we go through this next season of, of, of shaking, let's just call it like that. As we go through this next season of shaking, whether Donald Trump wins the presidency or Kamala Harris wins the presidency, it don't matter. You need to respond the same way. You need to respond as a people of peace. You need to be a peacemaker. Hallelujah. We don't know how things are going to line up. We don't know um, what's going to happen. But you know who does know? 
Jesus knows. Jesus knows what's going to happen. And while we can never agree with evil, we can never call evil good and good evil like our society seems to be doing right now. We have to respond. We have to respond to what's going on in society. Because, see, here's the bottom line. God wants to save souls. God wants to draw all men and women onto himself. And he wants to use people like you and me to be a part of that, to be that. This is why the body of Christ, the church, is, has been left here. It is here right now. He doesn't just save you and take you out of the earth. Maybe some people he does. But he saves you for a purpose. And our purpose, whether you're in the church in China or Iran or you're in the church in the urban setting or a suburban setting, the, the purpose of the church is still the same. You, we are not a political unit. We are above politics. We are called to be the head and not the tail. We are called to be uh, salt and light in, in our world. Hallelujah. But we have to use the weapon of peace. In Ephesians chapter 6, as we look at the armor of God, one of the weapons is having our feet shod with the shoes of peace, the gospel of peace. We must spread the gospel of peace during these turbulent times. And what does this peace mean? I mean, if, if Jesus didn't come to bring peace but the sword, why is he called the Prince of Peace? He's called the Prince of Peace not necessarily to bring peace on earth, at least now in the short term. He's called to bring peace between man and God. Peace between man and God. Again, I would point out that the church, our job is not to necessarily bring peace and not come into agreement with all the crazy stuff people are saying. Our job is to bring peace between God and man. Hallelujah. To spread the gospel, the gospel of peace. Now, I said all this, and yet I can feel anxiety. I know there's that anxiety in the atmosphere unlike maybe ever before. I remember during COVID, my brother would, my brother who, whatever, I mean, he might be a Muslim, we don't know, but my brother would would every so often say, man, I just feel anxious and I don't know why. And many of us feel anxious right now. Anxiety is in the air. Yet the Bible in Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 6, says this, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known. And the peace, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts in our minds through Christ Jesus. And then he tells us how to do this in our prayer closet as we pray. He says, brethren, finally brethren, 
whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever, th whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And then the apostle goes on and says, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. I would argue that if you don't have that peace of God in your life, that you are not doing these things that you are concentrating on all the crazy stuff in our personal lives and also all the things that could go down. I would say that you are thinking on the wrong things if anxiety is reigning in your life. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I've been anxious before. I've had anxiety in my life. Probably more so now than ever before. I've waked up, stayed up at night. Until I got right with God until I was in a place that the anxiety didn't bother me anymore. Sometimes I'd have to do that every night. I'd wake up three in the morning, but I'd be anxious, couldn't go back to sleep, until my mind got right with God. Until I was right. Brothers and sisters, this is what you must do too. You must get along with God, spend quality time with him, Think on whatever's good, whatever's pure, whatever's righteous. Give glory to God. And understand that God has this all under control. But we have to use the weapon of being peacemakers. Okay? Again, that's not agreeing with evil. There is a definite distinction between good and evil. Good is in the Bible. Evil is anti-Bible. Why do we have to get this right? Because that's our purpose. Our purpose is to become sons and daughters of God. You don't just one day wake up and be a son and da or daughter. And you don't just say a prayer and become a son or daughter. You become a son or daughter of God by accepting his son, Jesus Christ who came to bring peace between us and God. 
It was God becoming flesh, becoming like us, so that peace may be reestablished between man and God. Now in Romans 8 again, the whole world is waiting on the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. The sons and daughters who have inherited the kingdom and are truly walking in this kingdom of heaven. But you have to be that people. You have to be that person. Because if you are that person, you are the real remedy between what's going on in this earth. You are the real remedy for what people need. What they need to overcome, anxiety. I will say this. I will close with this. I believe that this is the church's, and I don't mean just First Assembly. I believe that this is the church's finest hour. I believe that, yes, we're a very small remnant as Isaiah 1.9 tells us. But this can be the church's finest hour. And I believe it, it will be the church's finest hour. The only question is, will it be your finest hour? I want it to be my finest hour ever. I want to see revival happen right in our midst. I want to see crazy cool things happen. God show up in miraculous ways. I want to see all this happen. But it's going to happen through his people. This is why he's making the distinction right now. Who are his? Who aren't? Who are the sheep? As we've been talking a lot about sheep lately. Who are the goats? And he knows those that are sheep goats. Those that are lukewarm. Those that straddle the fence. I'm not a straddler. Could you see me walking on top of a fence? That'd be painful. <laughs> I don't walk on the fence. I don't walk near the fence. I'm, I'm way over here. <laughs> way over on the right. You know. Why? Because I believe the Bible is true. I believe that Jesus Christ is God the Son. And I choose to be with him. And I'm excited about what's going to happen. Mm -hmm.